the legislative spotlight tonight, the medical marijuana bill reaches a final reckoning. Lawmakers continue efforts to carve out new cities in DeKalb County, and the Religious Freedom Bill continues to vex lawmakers. All that, plus a live report from our team at the Capitol, and Senator Josh McCoon joins us in our studio. Lawmakers starts right now. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. It is day 36 of the 2015 session. The Religious Freedom Bill does remain one of the most debated issues at the Gold Dome. And that is why Senator Josh McCoon has had to cancel plans to be with us tonight. As we're on the air tonight, the House Judiciary Committee is continuing to meet on his SB 129. But there's plenty of other news to cover tonight, starting with Pat St. Clair's Capitol Report. Pat? Good evening, Bill. Governor Deal is celebrating a victory tonight. His signature legislation to set up opportunity school districts in Georgia received final approval in the House today. Both measures, which allow the state to take over failing schools, passed, but the vote on the resolution was key because it is a constitutional amendment and needed 120 votes for approval. It squeaked by with just 121 votes. This legislation will act as a challenge to those local boards to say, if you don't get your house in order, then we will. Representative Christian Coomer presented the resolution on the floor for the constitutional amendment. Others rose to speak in favor, including Representative Amy Carter, who is also a school teacher. If my two children were in one of these schools that is a failing school for three consecutive years, that's 60, a grade of a 60, and they're in three years in that same school. As a parent, I'm gonna put my foot down and say something else needs to be done. And in my opinion, this is it. The opposition was spirited, but outnumbered. My concern is yes, it does put more power into the governor's office. That doesn't mean I'm opposed to the current governor. What it means is that I worry about what that future governor may look like. We should be brave enough to say not yet and bold enough to get it right. We owe our children no less, and I would argue that we owe them so much more. And so, Mr. Speaker, I stand here asking for opposition to SR 287, not because it is not good intention, not because it is not aspirational, but because it is not yet ready. After the vote, we caught up with House Minority Whip Carolyn Hughley, who had urged her colleagues in the House not to support the resolution. The resolution uh, is the constitutional amendment. And my main point is a constitutional amendment should have a question that is valid so that people can have a chance to make an informed decision. And our question doesn't do that. Our question is designed to elicit a yes answer. And that's not fair to the constituents that I represent. And that's my primary objection. If it's a good idea, we should be bold enough and fair enough to tell people what we're talking about. Now, um, House Minority Leader Stacey Abrams also took to the well today, and she was very passionate in saying that we need more time with this, that people are perhaps well-intentioned, but that's right now, and down the road, you don't know what may happen. So is that sort of what you're saying here? Yes, this is about making public policy. Public policy is not just for the immediate future, but for down the road, particularly when you're talking about placing something in the Constitution, because once we, it gets in our Constitution, it's going to stay there for all practical purposes. So that's why we need to be deliberate and we need to be thoughtful before we head down a path to change our Constitution. Now, the vote on the actual education bill passed 108 to 52. The governor is, of course, expected to sign the legislation once it gets to his desk. Even though the Senate approved the governor's education measures two weeks ago, the subject came up on the Senate floor today. Senator Vincent Ford, who opposed the education plan, denounced the governor for sidestepping his own executive order and allowing lobbyists to pay for his fact-finding trip to Louisiana to look at that state's school reform program student first, which is a policy and political player here in Georgia, have given $1.3 million to campaigns and gave $250,000 in 2012 to uh, promote the charter school amendment referendum. 
that student first paid that $14,000 for a junket to New Orleans, and apparently in violation of the governor's own policy of not accepting gifts from lobbyists. The trip was focused on uh, information. The trip was focused on uh, educating uh, legislators as to options. And at no time was anyone uh, in my, that I witnessed put in any sort of compromising position uh, to any even a small degree. Another action in the Senate today, there was good news for Tesla Motors. On a 48 to 4 vote, the Senate gave final approval to a bill allowing Tesla to sell its all electric cars directly to consumers without going through independent dealers. The bill now goes on to the governor's desk to await his approval. Finally tonight, a moment of triumph in the House for Representative Alan Peake and his medical marijuana bill. Peek celebrated in the front of the chamber after the House approved HB1 on a vote of 160 to 1 after it was amended in the Senate yesterday. House Speaker David Ralston came down to hug Hallie Cox and her mother. The bill is called the Hallie's Hope Act, and they are one of the families who moved to Colorado to get cannabis oil for her treatment. As they walked off the floor to applause, Speaker Ralston said, some days make it all worthwhile. I think most reporters who covered this issue would be quick to agree with Speaker Ralston. It is really quite a story. Bill, back to you. Thanks, Pat. And uh, Alan Peake will be our guest on Lawmakers tomorrow evening. I think he'll probably still be celebrating at that point. For sure. <laughs> Thanks for your report. So let's get started. Um, I'm here tonight with Greg Bluestein, political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He is one of the contributors to one of the best political blogs you could possibly read, Political Insider at the AJC. Also, we're very glad to have Brian Robinson, who's deputy chief of staff and spokesman for Governor Nathan Deal. As soon as the Opportunity Schools bill passed today, we called Brian Robinson and said, come in here and we'll give you a chance to celebrate a little, too. Thanks for being here. Uh, Brian, but before we get, look, you uh, got a, a, a couple of stories uh, in our newscast about this trip to New Orleans. Do you want to respond to the people who have uh, uh, questioned whether that was appropriate or not? Well, I, I think... Uh, <clears throat> The readers of the paper can look at the facts that are presented, even in the skewed manner in which they were presented, and see that the governor acted completely within the uh, within the executive order, and it was a uh, completely proprietous uh, endeavor on his part. We uh, wanted to educate legislators on how this is working in other states. That's all it was. This is being paid for by a group that in no way stands to benefit financially, in no way will profit from passage of this legislation. Students first, their special interest is poor kids. It's kids who aren't getting a good education, kids who aren't getting uh, the hope of the American dream. And that was the perfect third party to step in for an educational uh, endeavor such as this. You know, they went in on Thursday night and they had a dinner with presentations and PowerPoints and talkers, uh, school superintendents and legislators, and then Friday they had school visits. This was not a wild uh, party on, uh, on Bourbon Street. This was right. not Mardi Gras. Okay, good. Um, and, 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 and I want to say, this came at no cost to taxpayers. Right. Okay, we well. To educate legislators <clears throat> without any cost to taxpayers and with no lobbyist getting uh, who stands to benefit uh, being involved. Okay, well, let's want to give you a chance to, to say that. Um, Greg Bluestein, Opportunity Schools passed today by the thinnest of margins in the House, yes? Just like in the Senate. I mean, the Senate needed 38 votes. It got exactly 38 votes. In the House, it needed 120 votes. It got 121. So these were both squeakers. I mean, you talk about nail biters at the Capitol. This was the day. Tell us real quick, how did it break out in terms of Democrats and Republicans? So there are 119 Republicans. Four of them didn't, four of them voted no, and Five didn't vote, um, and the speaker also didn't vote, of course. Uh, but the Democrats filled that gap right there with 11 votes for it. Yeah, they had said they were going to lock down their caucus, but in fact, they had defections. Today. There was a little bit of a mini revolt, and, and in fact, three of the speakers uh, for the bill were all Democrats and, and some high-ranking Democrats. So, Brian, um, congratulations. Uh, this is the governor's signature piece of legislation. So. What's the next step on this? It's going to go to the voters, obviously. That's right. Um, what kind of campaign do you imagine mounting between now and it won't be till November of 2016? How tough a sell do you think this will be to the voters of the state? 
I think we can look back at what happened in 2012 with the charter school amendment vote where we got 58 percent of the vote. And you saw, particularly in counties where you have these failing schools, our vote margins in those counties were the highest. Now, ironically, many of those counties, their legislators voted against charter schools and many of them voted against opportunity schools. That is in uh, completely against what their constituents are demanding. These are parents whose kids are trapped in failing schools. They want alternatives. I, I think they are right to ask their legislators, why are they not standing up for the needs of these children and these families? And it, it is a failure to lead. And what Governor Deal has done here is to put children first. And these aren't families that voted for him necessarily, uh, certainly not pe uh, groups that have been his political supporters. He's doing it because it's the right thing to do. As the governor said today in his release, we have a moral duty and a self-serving interest to pass this legislation. Is there going to be, do you imagine, an opposition campaign mounted that talks about local control and how important that is? And how do you counter that? <clears throat> well, we certainly hope so. We're happy to have that conversation. You know, if you are on a wreck on a, a state road and, and a law enforcement comes, you don't ask if it's a state trooper or if, or if it's a, a county sheriff because you want to make sure it's the right jurisdiction involved. You want the person who can help you right that moment because time is of the essence. And for children who are trapped in our failing schools right now, they don't have time to wait. The status quo isn't working. We know it's not working. And the fact is, the critics of this who want to mount an opposition to the ballot initiative have an uphill battle. I mean, the, 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 the 20, it's about 25 word constitutional amendment. It's fairly innocuous. There's no word, there's no mention of taxes or fees or any of the big red flag words. There's well, actually, there is no fiscal note no, attached there's not, to this. Yeah. Um, but one of the Democratic <clears throat> critics actually said that today. He said, listen, you know, once we pass this, it's a done deal because there's, there's no language in there that would defeat this. So already, already, you know, the governor and his allies have sort of a, they have the advantage here. Okay, so um, stay with us, Brian Robinson. We have to take a quick break. We've got a couple other issues we'd love to talk to you about. Um, so we'll do this. On Lawmakers coming up, we're going to take a moment to remember Gerald Bryant, a man who gave many years and much wisdom to this program, Lawmakers. We'll be back with that and more with Brian Robinson in just a minute. Georgian, you love your barbecue. I think that's awesome. Yeah. There's some flavor to it. I want to eat some barbecue. Okay. That is meaty deliciousness. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> Friday at 8 on GPP. This is 88.5 FM, Atlanta's new source for your news and information. Good morning. Let's start the conversation. What's on your mind, Atlanta? We want to hear from you. The news and information you've been looking for is here on 88.5. From Peachtree City to Piedmont Park, from Norcross to Decatur, GPB Atlanta is the source for stories from your community. All news, all information, all day. We had less than 24 hours to evacuate. There was a sea of people wanting to get out. It was a terrible moral dilemma. Who goes and who gets left behind? They looked up at the helicopters and they could see their eyes. Desperate eyes. On this date, March 25th, 1958, Governor Marvin Griffin signed an act authorizing an award of $250,000 for the first commercial oil well drilled in Georgia that would produce at least 100 barrels of oil per day. To date, this award has not been claimed. Welcome back to uh, Lawmakers. We continue with Greg Bluestein, political reporter for the AJC, and Brian Robinson, uh, deputy chief of staff and spokesman for Governor Nathan Deal. Um, we expect that when this 
House subcommittee um, on uh, RIFRA, on the Religious Freedom Bill, uh, is finished, we could possibly get an amendment that clarifies there won't be discrimination against gays and lesbians. Is that right? Exactly. We, and it softens the language some. And it also, uh, we hear that it will, the other parts of it will mirror exactly what the federal legislation, uh, the federal RIFRA legislation outlines. Okay. So that committee is still going on, to the best of our knowledge. We'll, if, they, if they reach a conclusion, we'll try to get it to you. Brian Robinson, uh, early on, the governor said uh, that he, in principle, agrees with the notion of having a religious freedom bill. Yeah. Uh, the session is coming to an end. Um, what does he think about it today? Well, you know, Governor Deal had talks before the session with Representative Sam Teasley uh, about this bill. He's the House sponsor, and uh, the House is where it has not passed yet. And he's had uh, ongoing talks with him uh, this week about that legislation. And the governor said to him, bring to me, get through the House, uh, a piece of legislation that looks like the federal law that Governor Deal, by the way, voted for in mm -hmm. 1993 right. as a member of Congress. Right. And I will sign it into law. Uh, the governor believes that people of faith uh, need to be protected. And um, he certainly doesn't uh, see this as particularly controversial, doesn't see it as discriminating against any, any group, and would not want to see it discriminate against any group. So, so if there is an amendment that says this bill is not intended, or this statute will not, is not, cannot be used to discriminate against gays, lesbians, or any other minority group, that would make it a little bit more appealing to the governor? Well, the governor doesn't want to get too deeply involved in the legislative process. It's okay. still, still now going through the committee. Okay. Uh, what we will say is that if... The House passes it, and the Senate then uh, comes to some agreement or compromise because the bills are somewhat different now. Then the governor will sign it if it's close to what he signed, uh, what he voted for. What he for voted for Congress. with the federal RIFRA yeah. back in the 90s, yeah. the Clinton RIFRA. And, uh, okay, Greg Bluestein, um, we've very rarely seen the kind of emotional demonstrations that we saw on the floor of the House today when. Uh, Alan Peake finally got final passage on his medical marijuana bill. It was a really kind of a heartwarming moment. We don't get many of those at, 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 under the gold dome. Yeah, and it's been a long time in coming for, for Representative Peake. He's been pushing for this bill for years. It was held up at the, at the last minute last year. I mean, an emotional, uh, you know, very tense moment last year. All, all the, uh, the, the, the children with these maladies were all waiting outside the legislative chamber as lawmakers said we, we couldn't make a deal. This year, they made a deal with some time to spare. Brian Robinson, um, candidate deal, uh, the incumbent, uh, said in his campaign that he was going to, uh, he promised a medical marijuana bill would happen. So um, did he, in fact, get involved in any way to try to make sure he made good on this campaign promise? He absolutely was involved. We've met with Alan Peak before and during the session. We've been talking with Representative Peak really throughout this entire process, and we have been deeply involved. The governor's been personally uh, giving suggestions on uh, how broad or how narrow the bill should well, be. Well, that was actually, I, I should have been more specific. As, as you well know, there were some uh, voices in the Senate which hoped that this bill would be limited to just treating children with seizure disorders as opposed to the nine conditions in the House version. Did the governor weigh in on whether he thought there should be additional conditions for children and adults that would be covered? Before the session, the governor had met with Peake uh, on a, a list of conditions, and the governor had signed off on that list. Um, again, this is a medication that is in liquid form. It's not smoked. It uh, has almost no THC in it, which is the, the part of the drug that gets you high. So it's, it's not a Pandora's box coming into the state. The governor said in his state of the state address that we want to bring our families home from Colorado without becoming Colorado. Yeah, that was and, one of the best was, lines in the campaign. I have to say many of us thought that, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, he did a great job with that. So um, and we feel like this legislation accomplishes that vision that the governor laid out in the campaign and during the State of the State address. Okay, so next steps on this. Um, you've got, a, a, again, a lot of emotion has built up here, families with young children who've been following this closely. This is obviously an opportunity for you and the governor to do something ceremonially that will uh, reflect uh, why this bill is so important to so many people. What do you have in mind? Well, I think uh, a lot of the drama and emotion that has built up is, is because this has taken uh, a while. The, the, of course, the disappointment last year in Sunny Die when it didn't get passed. And so uh, these families uh, face terrible circumstances that most of us 
couldn't even begin to imagine. I, I can't imagine having to send a child with my spouse out to Colorado to live so that they can get the medication they need. It's just, it's uh, terrible to think about. So we want to get this process moving as quickly as possible so that those families can begin to come home. That is our number one goal. And so there will take a little bit of time to get the process started. We've got to get the agencies in the state involved to make sure there's a registration process so these families can get signed up. It doesn't happen with a snap of the fingers. So what the governor is going to do is sign an executive order on Friday that will make the state agencies begin that process, uh, even though he probably won't be able to sign the bill until after Sonny died to make sure we don't have any conflicts with other legislation that might cancel out this bill. So we want to make sure that this bill is preserved. So we need to wait a little bit, but it's time for state agencies to get to work so that when it is signed, we're not a week behind or two weeks behind. We want to get these families home. We want to get them registered. We want these kids to have this medication as quickly as possible. Okay, um, we got just a couple minutes here, so I let's do a little. Let, let's talk personally for a minute. Um, <laughs> Greg Bluestein, uh, Brian Robinson. Uh, we've put it up on the screen, I think, already. Has a very interesting Twitter handle. <laughs> he does. Do you, you know what it is? Lord Tinsdale. <laughs> Lord Tinsdale. With a, with a pirate patch, I think. Who is that Lord is Tinsdale, and what is that all about, Mr. Robinson? <laughs> Lord, Lord Tisdale is a completely fictional uh, uh, captain, uh, master of a fictional pirate republic. And Lord at Lord Tisdale is what you end up with yes. when you come to Twitter so late that you can no longer be at Brian Robinson or at Brian C. Robinson. And I, I did not want to be at Brian Robinson, you know, 0475. You know, I want, and so I just came up with a new name. Yeah. And it's completely made up. And is this because you have some particular interest? Did you have, have a particular love of pirates as a young boy? Is I love it? pirates. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to uh, going to Disney World with my parents and going on that uh, Pirates of the Caribbean ride. I mean, I've been hooked ever since then. So. Brian Robinson, thank you very much for sharing insights about the governor and also for telling us a little bit more about, about you. Yeah, follow me. Uh, at, at Lord Tinsdale. Lord all right. Um, before we get out of here tonight, we want to send it back down to the Capitol, where Pat St. Clair is located, a person of interest. Pat? Well, you know, Bill, sometimes in the routine of the workday, you fail to notice the people who help make your life a little bit easier every day. But Lenny Taylor is not one of those folks because of the way he goes about his job as a capital safety officer. That's why he's our person of interest. Yeah, I love my job. Some people say, oh, I see someone there who likes their job. I said, correction, I love my job. Good morning, ladies. How y'all doing this blessed, beautiful morning? Good, good, good. It's the way he greets everyone. Again. Good morning. How you doing? Happy Wednesday. He makes everyone feel special. Happy beautiful Wednesday. Happy beautiful Wednesday. Yes. It's just a good encouragement to just to see the people that come across. You never know what they're going through. You never know what they have gone through. So the smile, the joy, the peace, that just really makes me just bubbly inside to help them out, get across the street. Go all the way down. Go all the way down. Put your lights on. Come on, sir, you want to cross over? I'm crossing. You're crossing this morning? You can see Taylor is quite the entertainer, and he didn't just start when he put on his uniform. When I was in the military, I was a former comedian. Then when I came out of the military, um, I just kind of was searching around. And then all of a sudden, Tyler Perry uh, had uh, some information out in the newspaper as a uh, extra in uh, Meet the Browns. So uh, I was part of that, uh, that casting, uh, Meet the Brown. I'm going to let it shine. I sing for the Lord. I sing uh, in the Men Faith Choir at Hopewell Baptist Church. And uh, also, I'm a choir assistant choir director. So I do a little singing for the Lord. Come on, sir. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. The house just got out. Uh oh. We ready to go? Even with so much going on around him, Taylor has a secret for keeping calm. Good time, but I have to kind of like hold it down, hold it within, and do the woo saw. The woo saw is like, oh, you just got on my nerve. But I have to keep it to myself. 
I see you, sir. Without a doubt, sometime when I stop traffic and I look to my left and then someone just dash across and I'm like, hey, you didn't hear the whistle. So sometimes I catch them doing that, but at the same time, majority of, but majority of people are very respectful when, when they hear the whistle or when they see me trying to, do, to direct traffic. Those of us who cross the street every day look forward to seeing Officer Lenny Taylor. And it's an honor and a privilege um, just to just be down here and just to love on the people, the joy. And um, once again, thank you so much. Officials with the Capitol Police say Officer Taylor was put on that busy street because of his personality and the way he goes about his job. And to that, we say amen. Bill, back to you. Yeah, Pat, you know, Lenny Taylor is always upbeat and happy. I got to say, he gave it a little extra spin knowing that you were there with a microphone and camera. Oh, yes, <laughs> most definitely. <laughs> Thanks so much. We want to end our show tonight by saying goodbye to a GPB lawmaker's legend. Gerald Bryant, who was a longtime GPB producer, anchor, and host, passed away on his birthday, March 22nd. GPB's David Zelsky narrated the following story that honored Gerald on his 60th birthday, which was in 2006. Born in Louisville, Kentucky in 1946, Gerald had a happy childhood and dreamed of being a cowboy or even a swimsuit model. But when his marching band career didn't work out, he opted for television. Gerald began his career in broadcasting at WAVE-TV while still a student at the University of Louisville. Upon graduation in 1969, Gerald served as a photographer, reporter, producer, assistant news director, and eventually promotion director for that NBC network affiliate. From 1976 to 1979, he was a movie critic, promotion director, and producer for WHAS-TV, the CBS affiliate in Louisville. And from 1979 to 1981, Gerald was a producer and executive producer for WLKY-TV, the ABC affiliate, also in Louisville. In 1981, when he was all out of affiliates, Gerald and his family moved to Atlanta, where he worked at Turner Broadcasting as a senior producer of two magazine programs. Then in 1984, Gerald began his tenure at Georgia Public Broadcasting, where he has been a writer, producer, host, executive producer, and managing editor. Now the giraffes aren't here at the zoo today because of all the construction going on, and I certainly hope Zoo Atlanta officials haven't tied the giraffes to telephone poles outside because according to this book, it is indeed illegal to tie giraffes to telephone poles in the city of Atlanta. Now Charlie Barnwell of the city attorney's office says he can find no such ordinance in the grazing livestock, that's right, grazing livestock section of the Atlanta Municipal Code. But I have this book as proof. And what does Mr. Barnwell have? A library full of law books. Need I say more? There is a huge and fascinating array of products for sale here to certain agencies. For instance, here's good old federal lubricant, comma, interlocking slide fastener. Now, that translates into zipper ease. Now, just why the federal government needed so much zipper ease, or why it doesn't need it anymore, is a matter of pure speculation. I'm not sure what the heck this thing is. Actually, it's a Cybex Tracer, which can be used for training or rehab. I think I'm gonna need it for both. Whether he is interviewing the governor or a personality a bit less serious, Gerald always brings his professionalism, integrity, and probably most important, his sense of humor to every program he touches. Boy, am I an idiot. Boy, am I a moron. 32 years, and I'm faux surfing in front of a faux ocean. Gerald Bryant retired from GPB in 2007. He'll be greatly missed by all of us who knew and loved him. I got to work with Gerald quite a bit during his years at GPB. He was always a smart, funny, and very decent human being. Day 36 is down. We just have four more legislative days to go before Signe die. We'll be back tomorrow night with coverage of Day 37, plus an interview with Representative Alan Peek. What has to happen next to make medical marijuana a reality for Georgians? So as we leave you tonight, my thanks again to Greg Bluestein of the AJC, Brian Robinson of the governor's staff. 
We want you to stay in touch with us on social media. And you can email us at lawmakers at gpb.org. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Good night. This is a GPB original production.